There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, aboran, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Now just imagine you were an analytical chemist. Analytical chemist. Remember, those were the chemists who analyze samples for the concentrations of different types of elements within them. So you were an analytical chemist, and you were told that there might be Let's say there's lead pollution somewhere close by. Now, within your town or district that you're working at, so you might check, okay, well, if there's chemical and lead pollution, there might be lead pollution at different types of sites. So first you go to a car track. Let's say this car track was made in the 1950s. And you go to the soil surrounding the car track and take a sample, and you label it sample A. Then you go and go to a sort of a greeny area which is foresty and at some random spot you collect another sample and you say that's sample B and there's a lake in between that those different types of samples. So now I've got two samples and what would you do with those samples? Well I mentioned earlier again this is a diagram that I didn't make it comes from the HC online website and anyone who um, has never heard of HC online it's a quite a good website that gives you a very concise information for all dot points but this diagram comes from the HC Online website. And it's basically just the AAS um, procedure that we went through a couple of videos back. The idea is that you have this lamp, which has the wavelengths, which emits the wavelengths of the different types of elements they're looking for. You have the sample, so we have sample A or sample B. Be here, so A or B. First we put in A, put it in, it will be vaporized. And that means this flame contains the atoms of this sample. Then it will go, the actual parts will be, it will be absorbed. So this light that is, goes through will be absorbed, partially absorbed by these atoms. And some of the light, not all the light will pass through. And this light will go for the monochromata, which selects one of the wavelengths, right? So let's say it selects wavelength 417, which is used to detect certain types of elements. Then it goes for the photomultiplier, and the last thing you get is you get a readout. So this is the readout. This is your actual absorbance. So let's say sample A, we get a readout of 0.48, and sample B, we get a readout of 0.09. So what does this information tell us? How can we use this information? Well, first of all, we generally have a, a standard sample. This is a standard sample data. So we had our known concentration. So let's say concentration of one part per million of lead had an absorbance of 0 0.10. A concentration of lead of, 0 point, uh, of two parts per million had an absorbance of 0 0.19. Of three parts per million had, had an absorbance of 0 0.28. And an absorbance of four part, uh, sorry, a concentration of four parts per million had an absorbance of 0 0.37, right? So this data we gathered beforehand. We have, might have gathered ourselves or it might be given to us. And we have to use this data to figure out roughly how which place is more polluted and also how much by, by how much more is there pollution. But roughly what's the concentration of lead in these different samples. So we can say, okay, well, sample B, which is in that foresty part, has a absorbance of 0 0.09. That would be less than 0 0.19. So it must be a bit less than one parts per million. So we can say, it might be, it would be less than one part per million lead concentration within that sample. The other one has an absorbance rating of 0 0.48, and that means it would be higher than 0 0.37, so it would be somewhere higher than four parts per million. So it's going to be a higher concentration of lead than four parts per million. That obviously, that already tells us we're going to have a higher concentration of lead in sample A than sample B. And that also makes sense because sample A comes from close to a car track, which was built in the 1950s. And remember that unleaded petrol was only started to being phased out by 1978 and was only fully banned by 2002, which means that all the cars that rode around there beforehand would have all emitted lead, and that lead would have gotten into the soil which is why we have a higher reading in sample A than in sample B. So we reused all this information, which is second-hand information,
well, actually, in this case, it's first-hand. This is first-hand information, right? Because you collected it yourself. So this is first-hand information because you did the whole um, sampling. But let's say the analytic chemist who collected that data, he gave you the, the information. So he gave you the data. You didn't collect it yourself, but he gave it to you. He gave you all of this data here, this, this one here, which means now it turns from a first-hand sort of data to secondary data or a second-hand data because you didn't collect it yourself. You were given to it by someone else, and then therefore it's secondary data. So it's first-hand data if you do it yourself, and secondary data if you don't do it yourself, but you either look at it up maybe in an exam, you give, you give them the values in the exam, or you're, someone else gives it to you. If you don't do it, it's second-hand data or secondary data. The reason why I mention all this is because the point itself says, gather, process, and present information to interpret secondary data from AAS measurements and evaluate the effectiveness of this in pollution control. Right. So we also got to evaluate the effect effectiveness of this in pollution control. But this would be the example. We we have this is our second hand data. Someone else gave it to us, and we got to figure out is there pollution happening? And there's so many exam questions, HC exam questions, that are very similar to this. You have just a bunch of data given. You need to figure out maybe sometimes roughly how much pollution there is. Other times you just simply have to figure out if there's more pollution at one place than another place, etc., etc. So this would be one example of what you might have to do in an exam. And the other example would be, for whatever reason, they every time this kind of question comes up, there's always a graph that you have to actually make. Right? So for example, let's say this is the same data we had beforehand. This was the standard data. You would have this kind of graph where you have absorbance on the one side and concentration of lead on the other side. And what you do is you simply plot that data. So let's say concentration of lead, one part per million is 0 0.1. Of two parts per million is 0 0.19, roughly, roughly here. Three parts per million is 0 0.28, roughly here. And four parts per million is 0 0.37, so that would be roughly here. Then you would do a line through it. It's, it's, it's like a straight line. And then what you can do is you have sample A and sample B. Sample B would be somewhere roughly here, so here, because it's at 0 0.09, so 0 0.09 is right here, so it would be roughly here. And then you could just read off what that gives you, and that would give you roughly a 0 0.9 parts per million. And sample A had a concentration of 0 0.48, so 0 point, now we just, we extrapolated the data, so we have more data than we had beforehand. 0.48 is roughly here, which means that in terms of concentration, again, this is an estimate, it would be roughly at sort of four, five-ish parts per million for that data, for the sample, this is sample A, and the other one was sample so you might be expected to also draw a graph when it comes to this kind of question, but these questions aren't usually too hard. But you just need to be aware that you might have to draw a graph and that you might have to interpret data because that's what the dot point itself says. It also says and evaluate the effectiveness of this in pollution control. Overall, it's it, overall it's very effective, and the reason why is because it can do sort of very small concentrations. It can do very small concentrations. We can also use it to sort of pinpoint specific types of elements. Specific types of elements. So the data itself is always often just used for one specific type of element. So not just it won't just tell us that there are small concentrations of, of elements, but also we can use it to figure out small concentrations of a specific type of element. There, so these are kind of the reasons why it's really effective because it can um, measure very small concentrations, so parts per million, which is tiny. And also we can just focus on one element as opposed to having just a bunch of elements, we can focus on one. The limitation is, even though it's very precise, for certain, so the limitation is that sometimes it's still not precise enough for certain elements, we still can't make it accurate enough, but overall, it's generally good enough to figure out pollution in different samples. So for example, we can use it to 
figure out air samples. We can use air samples and figure out what kind of pollution is in air. We can figure out soil samples. So we collect soil sample, do the same procedure, do that AAS procedure, and figure out the concentrations of different types of elements within that soil. Or we can do it for water as well. That's another reason why it's very useful, because we can do air samples, soil samples, and water samples, and we can figure out the concentration of different elements for those samples. Limitation is that just for some elements, it's still not precise enough, or that the scope, I mean, we can only go to certain parts per million, not low it, but overall it's really effective. It has, we can calculate smaller concentrations, we can pinpoint certain elements, and we can test the air, soil, and water. And yeah, for this top point, you need to know that, just the effectiveness of it all. And also, you need to be aware that you need to interpret data. So you might be given this kind of scenario where you might be said, okay, we collect sample A here, sample B here. This is the data you're given. Figure out which one has more. And sometimes even figure out how much by how much more. And that you need to be drawing a graph for that from the data as well. And so this is what you might be expected to do. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.